When we think of fictional fathers from movies and TV, we tend to think of the bumbling dad trope, a goofy and dim-witted father who loves their children but struggles to take care of them. However, Disney has a wide range of fathers, from great dads to evil guardians. Oh, my dear Quasimodo. For Father's Day this year, we decided that it's only appropriate to rank the most iconic Disney dads from best to worst, specifically dads from Disney animated movies. I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge, and this is Disney Fathers Good to Evil. My son. Before we get started, it's important to state that these dads will be ranked only on their fatherhood skills, not their overall morality. So we might be seeing some great people being not so great fathers or vice versa. With that said, let's get started. This time we'll be starting with the worst and working our way through the bad and the evil before getting to the better dads on our list. Starting out with the absolute worst. Surprising virtually no one with our pick for the most evil Disney father, we have Claude Frollo. Frollo is the cruel and manipulative justice minister who adopted Quasimodo as an infant. Not out of the goodness of his heart, of course, but for fear of eternal damnation for murdering the child's mother and then attempting to drown the disfigured child. This is an unholy demon. I'm sending it back to hell. So, not a good start right out the gate. In order to keep the world from seeing him, Frollo locks the child away to work in the bell tower for his whole life and even gives him the demeaning name Quasimodo, meaning half-formed. He lies to Quasimodo about his past and convinces him that the only one who would ever show him mercy and kindness was himself. Despite this claim, Frollo doesn't miss an opportunity to berate Quasimodo, forcing him to call himself ugly and a monster. His upbringing causes Quasimodo to fear others and to have very low self-esteem. It's only after he is shown kindness by Esmeralda that Quasimodo begins to doubt the negative view of humanity his adoptive father has instilled in him. Unlike the other fathers on our list, Frollo has no love or even respect for the child he raised, attempting to murder him a second time at the end of the movie. In the end, he never redeems himself, falling into the fire to be punished for his crimes for all eternity. Not only is Frollo a terrible, awful father, Father, he really has nothing redeemable about him as a person in general. He deserves to burn. Earning himself the silver medal of evil is Pete from A Goofy Movie. While not the main focus of the film, it is made very clear that Pete is not a good father to his son PJ. He constantly tries to give Goofy parenting advice, despite the fact that his own son wants nothing to do with him. Don't let him fool you with that buddy buddy act now. Pete acts more like a drill sergeant towards PJ than a loving parent, barking orders at him and forcing the boy to call him sir. This leaves PJ to feel intimidated by his father and fear him throughout the movie. He isn't any better in the sequel, even though he has an even smaller role. He is downright giddy to kick PJ out and turn his room into a bowling alley. But I guess that's not all that surprising from the OG Disney villain. While not a straight up villain, our bronze pick is definitely no angel, but Cluck. After Chicken Little, his only son, is shunned and mocked for believing the sky fell, Buck very quickly turned his back on the little one. Quiet, son. This is embarrassing enough already. <laughs> While it is understandable why one might doubt this claim, it's pretty rough to see him completely bail out on his son and leave Chicken Little to fight desperately to win back his father's love. All I need is a chance to do something great. And it's only when Chicken Little hits a home run for a ball game that his father finally starts to show pride and accept acceptance for him. That's my boy out there. That's my boy. But when Chicken Little warns the town of aliens, Buck immediately abandons him again. While he does redeem himself and show he does love his son in the end, it's hard to defend him for never standing up for his son while he gets constantly berated from the entire town for the entirety of the whole movie. It's no wonder Buck Cluck is one of the most hated characters. Next up, we have the ape father of Tarzan, Kerchik. Now, he isn't in the bad category because of his treatment of his biological son, whom he was shown to be very playful and loving to, but rather for his tense relationship with his adoptive human son. No, 
You have to take it back. From the very beginning, Kerchik refuses to accept the orphaned infant as an ape or a son and is very cold towards him. After accidentally causing an elephant stampede, a young Tarzan is told that he would never be one of them. Kala, look at him. He will never be one of us. Facing rejection from the closest figure he had to a father leaves Tarzan to feel like an outcast in the only place he knows as his home. This leads him to work every single day to try and prove that he can be a great ape, so Kerchik would have no choice but to respect him. I'll make him see it. I'll be the best ape ever. In his defense, he was only trying to protect his family from the humans, but these actions still caused a lot of hurt and turmoil for Tarzan, who only gets his father's acceptance 18 years later on the gorilla's deathbed. Better late than never, I guess. Forgive me for not understanding. Moving along, we have the great prince of the forest, aka Bambi's father. While his worst crime in the original film is just being absent, we get a much better view of him as a father in the sequel. However, this is not a good thing for his case. As the film begins right after Bambi loses his mother, and his father discourages the fawn from fondly remembering his mother mere hours after her death. The great prince often scolds Bambi for not acting like a prince would. He even goes as far as spending the whole movie trying to pawn his child off on others and tries to give his son away to another doe to raise him. Finding a suitable doe to raise Bambi. This leaves poor Bambi to feel rejected by the one family member he has left as he tries to work for his father's love and support. His father does end up changing his mind and really stepping up as a father. But these actions are far too much for a young child to go through right after the death of his mother. Next up is the father of Queens Anna and Elsa, King Agnar. Okay, now you may be thinking that this is a pretty harsh ranking, but hear us out. As small children, Elsa accidentally strikes Anna with ice, leading the whole family to seek help from the forest trolls. After cleansing Anna's memories of Elsa's magic, they're warned of the girl's magic being possibly dangerous in the future. As a response, Agnar decides that they must lock up the castle and Elsa until she can learn to control her powers. Yes, King Agnar loved and adored both his children, but this one choice is responsible for almost everything that goes wrong in the film. Firstly, it causes Elsa to isolate herself, not only from the kingdom, but from her own sister as well. She grows up fearing her powers and herself. Conceal it. Don't feel it. Don't, Don't let, let it show. show. Her anxiety causes her to even miss out on her own parents' funeral. She wouldn't have accidentally frozen the entire kingdom and felt the need to run away if her magic wasn't treated as something to be feared. And the isolation doesn't only hurt Elsa, because Anna doesn't remember why her sister is locked away. Anna grows up alone, wondering why her sister doesn't want anything to do with her. The loneliness got to Anna too, making her desperate enough for love and affection that she very quickly fell for Hans. And we all know how that one turned out. While none of this was what their father wanted or expected, one poorly thought out parenting decision ends up hurting both his children for many, many years. And unfortunately, he can never apologize to his daughters. With that said, we move away from the bad fathers and into the gray area. And starting out the gray area, we have Chief Tui. Despite him loving his daughter and his island, his overwhelming fear of going beyond the reef puts both in danger. Moana has a deep love and attraction to the ocean, but is constantly dragged back to land by her dad. No matter how hard she works to be the perfect daughter, she can't ignore her love for the sea. Nor should she have to. It's time to be who they need you to be. His desperation for her to stay on land causes him to even yell at her in front of everyone on the island for suggesting that they might need to go beyond the reef for food. She thankfully ignores his scolding and decides to go beyond the reef and save her entire island. By the end, Chief Tui is able to realize his mistake and change his ways, for the better of the island and his daughter. Next up is Fazu, the father of Mulan. Zhu is a very traditional man, putting him in conflict with his only child, Mulan, who struggles to meet her family's expectations. While he truly loves his daughter and compares her to a late blooming cherry blossom, he is also very strict. He gets angry at her for questioning the fairness of some of their traditions, including him being forced to join the war a second time when he's already injured. He shames her for bringing dishonor on their family for trying to stand up for her father to save his life. Mula. You dishonor me. Despite this, he refuses to turn in Mulan when she runs away to serve in the army in his place, saving her life in doing so. 
Once Mulan returns home with gifts from the Emperor himself, Zhu throws that aside to hug the most important gift of all, his beloved daughter. Our next entry is the Sultan of Agrabah and father of Princess Jasmine. Outside of being a classic example of a bumbling dad trope, the Sultan isn't the best father to his teenage daughter. He was very pushy about Jasmine getting married to a prince, despite her wanting to wait until she finds someone she loves. He also forced her to stay in the palace walls, making Jasmine ignorant to what is going on in her kingdom. But Jasmine, you're a princess. What saves him from being a bad father is the fact that he was being constantly hypnotized by Jafar into making many of his choices. He was at least excited by Jasmine falling for Aladdin and was persuaded to change the law so she could marry the one she loved. From this day forth. However, that leaves the question, if he could have changed the law the whole time, why didn't he? Oh well, at least he finally gave in at the end. Kind of a dummy, but he means well at least. The true neutral of fathers goes to King Stefan from Sleeping Beauty. Because of a curse placed on his daughter by Maleficent, he never got a chance to raise his beloved daughter. Instead, he placed her in the care of three fairies until her 16th birthday. While this was only for her protection, it still never gave him a chance to raise Aurora, who never even knew he existed until the end of the film. Not all that good, certainly not bad, but just kind of there. Next is the father of Prince Charming, the king. While we never see him directly interact with the prince, he is involved in his life, perhaps a little too much. The king is overly eager to have his son get married and give him grandchildren to love and spoil. In order to rush the entire process, he throws a huge ball and invites every single eligible bachelorette in the kingdom so his son has no choice but to find somebody to love. While this is a bit overkill, he at least cares that who his son picks is someone that he truly loves and is more than okay with it being Cinderella. Pushy? Definitely, but we can cut him some slack for considering how his son feels. Finally, we arrive at the good, the pure. Thankfully, Disney has its share of good dads. Starting out with Belle's dad, Maurice. With Bill ostracized by the community, one of the only people who accepts her book-loving ways is her eccentric inventor father. Bill looks up to and loves her dad, while Maurice shows that he respects Bill and doesn't think she is odd like the rest of the town does. And while it is because of him that she ended up in the Beast's Tower, it was never his intention and he spends the entirety of the movie trying desperately to find help for his daughter, almost dying in the process. Besides, as we all know, her meeting the Beast turns out to not be all that bad. Still, although he's a sweet guy and loves his daughter, we can't help but point out that he's a bit kind of useless and unable to solve many problems. Not to mention the fact that he kind of creates issues for his daughter, such as getting himself imprisoned in the Beast's castle and eventually being used as leverage when Gaston wants to throw him in an asylum. Moving on, we have Goofy from a Goofy movie. Despite him not being the smartest dog around, he did a pretty good job raising his son, Max. It's clear that Goofy adores Max and does everything he can to ensure his son has a great life. However, he does have a bad habit of smothering the boy. He tends to be too influenced by outside sources, such as our second most bad father, Pete, and a tyrannical principal who both convince Goofy that Max is close to becoming a felon. A family vacation to go fishing initially fails because of Goofy's struggle to relate to a teenage boy. Thankfully, Goofy realizes his mistake halfway through the movie, better than most fathers on our list, and shows that he is just misguided, not malicious. Besides, any father that can manage to get you on stage with a famous celebrity without getting tased by a bodyguard is doing something right. Come on, Max, let's get you on stage. Another good father we have to mention is Chief Powhatan from Pocahontas. We can't deny the love he has for his daughter, which we see through his advice, as well as when he gives Pocahontas a necklace. He really only wants what is best for his daughter, even if he isn't correct and it isn't what she wants. This is the right path for you. By the end of the film, he proves himself to be a very kind and understanding dad and finally listens to his daughter's pleas. Now we have the king of the sea, King Triton. King Triton is a very strict and stern father to his seven daughters, including 
including the rebellious Ariel. I'm really looking forward to this performance, Sebastian. He clashes with her because of her interest in human culture, harboring a deep hatred of humans because of the death of his wife, Athena. While the grudge is understandable, it does go too far when Triton destroys Ariel's pride and joy, her collection of human things. This definitely crossed the line. However, he does quickly realize his mistake when Ariel runs away to be a human. He searches night and day for his lost daughter. He even gives up his freedom and his kingdom to save her. Maybe not the best political move, but a great move as a dad, and at the end of the movie, he does one of the hardest things a father has to do, let his daughter go. Really, we cut him a lot of slack on his overbearing personality because he suffered a great trauma with the loss of his wife. Surely it makes sense that he'd be worried about something happening to his daughter. And everything he does, both good and bad, he does to protect Ariel, willing to sacrifice everything for her at a moment's notice. Now on to Pinocchio's Geppetto. After a wish on a star, the kind and gentle woodmaker's puppet comes to life. While many people would probably be freaked out by this, he instantly accepts his new role and becomes a father to Pinocchio. He quickly becomes a very devoted dad to the little puppet, answering all of his questions, getting him ready for school and planning a huge meal for when he comes home. However, when Pinocchio runs away instead of going to school, Geppetto spends the whole movie looking for the puppet, even somehow getting swallowed by a whale in the process. And even when he lost all hope in escaping the whale, he still could only think of his child, hoping he was okay out there. I poor little Pinocchio. Once Pinocchio finally becomes a real boy, Geppetto rejoices and throws a party to celebrate. But even before this, he still loves and accepts his son for who he is, wooden joints and all. Our next father is the king of the gods and father of Hercules, Zeus. In this case, we can be glad that the movie wasn't accurate to the original myth because the Zeus from Greek mythology had a lot of problems to say the least. But the Disney Zeus is actually a good dad. He has a lot of love and pride in Hercules, throwing a huge party to celebrate his birth. Unfortunately, due to events out of his control, his only son is made into a mortal and thus cannot live on Mount Olympus until he reaches godhood. If you can prove yourself a true hero on Earth, your godhood will be restored. Even then, Zeus still does whatever he can to help Hercules, giving him advice and giving him a Pegasus steed to help him on his journey. Look how you've grown. It's clear that Zeus wants nothing more than his son's happiness, accepting Hercules' decision not to live on Mount Olympus, and instead to live on Earth with the woman he loves. Up next is Professor Archimedes Q. Porter. While on the surface he seems like a typical bumbling dad, it is very clear that he has a close bond with his daughter, Jane. They both share a deep love for gorillas and connect with this interest. Look, look, social grooming. He is also shown to value Jane's opinion and enjoy listening to his daughter ramble about her fascination with Tarzan while still teasing her a bit about it. Good Lord. But he shows his greatest act of fatherhood at the end of the film when he encourages Jane to follow her heart and stay in the jungle with Tarzan and even joining them himself. Not many fathers would give up the only world they know just for their daughter's happiness, but that's what puts Porter so high up on the list. Moving along, we have the father of 99 Dalmatian puppies, Pongo. This determined pooch was a dotting and involved father to his initial 15 puppies before they were stolen to make fur coats by the devious psychopath Corilla Deville. He and his wife go on a long and difficult journey to rescue their babies when they find another 84 puppies at risk of becoming a spotted coat. What? N 99? Without hesitation, Pongo decides to adopt the rest to protect them from Corella and immediately accepts all of them as his own. Buddy, we'll take them home with us. All of them. It takes a lot of love and kindness to adopt one child, let alone 84, when you already have 15 of your own, making Pongo not only a very good boy, but also an amazing dad. Oh, Pongo, you old rascal! Now then, the bronze medal of Best Disney Dad goes to Pacha from The Emperor's New Groove. There is no arguing that he is a great person. He's hardworking, friendly, and tries to see the good in everyone. Not only that, he is shown to be a real family man. I can't let you go back 
unless you change your mind. We only see him directly interact with his children twice in the film, but each time he is shown to be playful, fatherly, and loving with them. It's clear that he has a very close family just from the short interaction. His entire journey in the film is because of him wanting to protect his home and family, even if he has to face the Emperor to do it. Speaking of Kuzco, Pacha eventually develops a close relationship with him too, even being close enough that they spend the summers together with his family. We can't say that we would be all that forgiving after all Kuzco did, so that shows what a noble man and father he is. The silver medal for fatherhood goes to Tiana's father, James. He may not have gotten all that much screen time, but James's positive influence in his daughter's life is felt throughout the film. You do our little girl got a gift. He had a dream his whole life, to own and run his own restaurant. He shared his love of cooking with his young daughter, learning that she had a real gift for cooking. He also encouraged Tiana, saying that she needed to work for her dreams, causing her to grow up determined and hardworking. James is definitely one of the best Disney fathers because he struggled his whole life to take care of his family, working up to three shifts in a day, but never put that burden onto his daughter. He always kept a smile on his face for his child and still raised her with love and care. James unfortunately died in the war before he could make his dream a reality, but as his family says, he never got what he wanted, but he had what he needed. He had love. And finally, the gold medal for best Disney dad is King of the Pride Lands, Mufasa. From the very first scene, we see the affection he has for his newborn son. As Simba grows up, Mufasa is shown to take time away from his work as king to play with and teach his son how to be a great king himself. Even after Simba nearly gets himself killed by hyenas, the king is able to keep a level head and explain why Simba shouldn't have done that. You deliberately disobeyed me, and what's worse, you put Nala in danger. Keeping calm under pressure, especially when you're angry, is something many parents struggle with. But it is incredibly important when raising a child, and even in death, Mufasa is still looking after his son, and will always be there. You must take your place in the circle of life. Really, Mufasa is such a great father character because we see how much effort he puts into raising his son to be strong and honorable. Not only in life, but after his death as well. And we get to see Simba use the wisdom he received from his father to not only defeat Scar, but also grow into adulthood and start a family himself. Mufasa's death is probably the saddest moment in Disney history, and it's made so much more impactful by the fact that he was a perfect father. He loved his son and taught him with the perfect balance of care and strict rules, and he prepared Simba for his life and to pounce on any problem that comes his way. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Make sure you tell your dad you love him. And that's our list. Who do you think is the most pure or the most devious Disney dad? Don't forget to hit that notification bell and binge our Good to Evil playlist, where we break down the morality of the characters in your favorite shows, cartoons, and movies. But most importantly, stay wicked.